Folks, we're glad you're here to watch this presentation today. My name is Greg Allen. I'm an extension agent and down in Lake County. Um, uh, I'm Jake Mallard. I'm the extension agent in Madison County. I'm Richard Bunton. I'm the retired extension agent and director out of Crockett County. And today we're here to talk about some of the basics of no-till and maybe why you uh, would want to consider no-tilling if you're not currently no-tilling. And the reason that no-till got started in West Tennessee 40-something years ago was because of our soil erosion rates. Uh, West Tennessee has some very productive soils, but uh, they're also highly erodible. So the uh, University of Tennessee took the lead, and uh, on the uh, Mile Experiment Station under the uh, guidance of Dr. Tom McCutcheon, uh, became known as the Center for No-Till Research uh, nationwide. And... Uh, here at UT, we're very proud of that. So some of the other things uh, that uh, you might want to consider when you're looking to uh, start no-tilling is what type of operation do you have? Uh, especially uh, if you're a smaller, maybe a part-time grower with uh, limited uh, labor uh, availability, well, no-till is going to reduce your labor requirements. So that's certainly a reason that you might uh, want to consider no-tilling. Also, uh, what's your equipment? Uh, no-till will require uh, some fewer pieces of equipment and a little bit uh, smaller horsepower tractors than what you'd have to have for conventional tillage. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's, a, there's also uh, numerous uh, other reasons that we might want to uh, look at the no-till depending on where you are. are. Richard, I'd like to add to that that's on the larger side in my my county, it's all flatland Mississippi River Delta. We didn't have an erosion problem, but we were coming up with an, with a, an employee problem, finding enough labor. And a lot of our soils is mixed sand, silt, and clay in the same field. It was real hard to get a stand uh, once we went to no-till. Uh, you could pretty much get a stand across the field regardless of soil type. So that's that's been the real help for us, not having to replant and go into larger equipment and user, using fewer hired labor, uh, which is what's been the advantage for us. The one of the big advantage for us is just is the labor issue that we have in row crops today. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to find employees that want to stick around and work on the farm. Uh, so by being able to cut down a few people, you're able to run across your acreage uh, more efficiently together. The other things, we're looking at trying to make our soils a little bit healthier. We want healthy soils. We want to do everything we can do to help the soils. So when we remove that tillage equipment, we're not aggravating the soil as much, not creating as many hard pans and hard lines throughout the soil. So we're actually helping the soil to improve. Uh, we leave the old crop residue there, let the roots stay in the soil, which helps holds the soil in place and keeps it from eroding uh, during the winter months and during our rainy seasons. Uh, any of you guys that have ever uh, used a penetrometer or even a shovel uh, in some of your fields, you know that uh, after years of conventional style tillage, You've got a hard pan, as Jake said, and when you try and put that shovel through it, uh, much less a, a seed trying to put those roots down through it, you know you've got issues. And given time, uh, no-till uh, aids in eliminating these issues. We're also looking at reducing our runoff into our streams. Uh, everybody knows about the Mississippi River and carrying all the soil down to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so by doing no-till we're reducing our soil that's running off we're holding our soil on our own ground instead of giving it to the mississippi and polluting the river system and the gulf of mexico also that's keeping a lot of uh nutrients uh slash contaminants from running into our waterways and, and causing some issues uh downstream greg you've been around long enough uh you remember before we started no-tilling what a lot of our uh, uh, soil erosion losses were each year. I mean, we were losing, what, in excess of 20 tons per mm -hmm. acre of as soil? As much as, as 50. You're right. On some, on some slopes. And, and so now we're down uh, into... Well, it, it, was, it was bad enough that 
Uh, some guys was using the bulldozer every, every spring to go out and fill in the gully so they could plant over the field again. So uh, a lot of that has, has dissipated over the years. Um, we still see some little reels and little gullies that had to be on some really street, steep slopes that had to be repaired. But by and large, uh, it's just uh, it's just a whole lot smoother ground. I mean, we don't we're not not losing the soil that we were. Right, and we only have a limited amount of topsoil, and in our area, it's anywhere from six to eight inches deep to forty feet deep. I don't know what your area is like, but uh, it's certainly something that you should be considering. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you're into the environmental side, carbon sequestration, you leave the carbon in the ground, you don't disc the ground up, so you're holding your carbon in the ground, you're not releasing it into the atmosphere. Uh, so that's another benefit of no-till that we've got. For those of you who are from uh, out of state, just to give you a little uh, background on where we are, we're in Milan, Tennessee, which is centrally located in West Tennessee. So this is a row crop area. Uh, we'll grow uh, cotton, corn, wheat, uh, soybeans, uh, grain sorghum. Uh, those will be the major crops. So, you know, no-till will go across any number of, of your row crops that you're growing. I'm sitting here looking uh, behind the, the camera, and there's a cornfield back here that's shoulder high. Ours is, is obviously a lot shorter today that we're going to be working with. And we tried to make some mistakes. Um, and again, you know, Mother Nature dealt us uh, eight years ago we did this, and this turned out perfect. This year, it, the most rain we've had in May forever, and all the eels that we tried to produce here somehow got covered up. So we're going to try to tell you what we were wanting to see and a little bit of what we're going to see. Uh, what we intended to do with our goof ups will go across not only corn but soybeans, cotton, yeah. any other crop. And they're just they're just little yield robbers. One of the reasons we came up with this, we've each seen some situations where things just, you know, everything went wrong, and that was a wrong year. And that's and uh, like I said in 2008, we were able to show that here. Uh, but planting too wet. And if it turns off dry, which wasn't the issue this year, but if you plant too wet and it turns off dry, you can lose 20 to 50, 70 percent of your yield. Uh, and it's hard to see 20 percent loss. Uh, Visually, it's yes, hard to see it from just that, just that, um, just from that little mistake. And you won't even know that you've made it unless you get out here and do some digging. Um, and we're going to show and, you and some of that. Yeah. I'm going to discuss, we've got eight different treatments out here to show you today of various mess ups that we were hoping that would really show out. There are two row plots. Uh, we've got samples that we're going to show a little bit of uh, as we talk along. This first one was the treatment that we were hoping it would really show out. Uh, it was planted when the conditions were optimal. Uh, it was no-tilled. Uh, down pressure, pressure, or uh, closing wheel pressure was, was optimum. Um, actually, out in the field, it really doesn't show that much difference uh, to the other three treatments planted when it was, when it was, was uh, optimal or dry, uh, the, the treatments. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, placement, uh, roughly inch and three quarters, two inch deep was what the seed was on just about every one of them that we dug. Uh, trying to show the difference in the way the roots uh, went down into the soil, but seeing that we've got rain, pretty much the ground's been wet the whole time. There's the roots have have been able to penetrate and do what they were supposed to, even where we was trying to cause some sidewall compaction. That treatment right there had probably the most uniform stand across the whole whole plot. The plants are all uniform, all about the same height. Uh, they're all growing at the same rate, and the seed placement is pretty accurate on every six inches, five to six inches is where the seed placement was. And one thing that we have not hit on, and Greg mentioned op optimal down pressure and closing wheel, et cetera, uh, as Willie and Daryl uh, have said or will say, you have to change uh, your settings in the field. I mean, depends mm -hmm. on your soil type. 
uh, depends on the soil conditions. Soil so moisture. You, soil moisture. As you move from field to field or even within a field, uh, planter adjustments are going to have to be made in order to, uh, to avoid the excessive down pressure or the lack of down pressure or any of the other things. Are closing the seed furrow too much pressure on the, on the closing wheels? Are, are not enough where you're not getting good seed soil contact. It's just, it's, uh, it, it changes throughout the day and it certainly will change throughout the week. Uh, no till will show your sins. This is plot two, uh, two row plot. Uh, this is excessive closing wheel pressure. Uh, so basically what you're looking at in the field is hipped up in the middle where the row is, uh, squeezing it together, pinching it too hard. Uh, and if you'll look right here, we planted, what, an inch, inch and a half? About that. Most of, most of them, when we measured, was somewhere between, like you said, an inch and a half to two, to, and, a quarter. To two, two and a quarter. But uh, that, the, the deepest was in the plowed ground. So a lot of times when you get these issues, you'll get some pinching of the plant when it comes up, and they'll pinch off, snap off, break. Uh, we were wet this year. We've been wet this year. It rained again yesterday. So we're staying wet and it's actually forgiven some of our sins that we get, we did in the plots. But as you can tell, the roots compared to the optimum to too much down pressure, relatively the same, pretty close right now. Uh, the end during harvest will be a telltale sign. As far as the uniformity throughout the plot, this particular plot uh, is a little less uniform than the uh, plot that Greg's holding the plant out of, which was uh, the optimal conditions there. So it's, it's not terribly noticeable, uh, but there, there is a difference out there. All right, this is, this is treatment number three that we're gonna discuss, and this was too much down pressure on the planter unit, as opposed to just the, just the closing wheels. Uh, again, probably close to the same size as, as our optimal treatment was. Uh, the difference that we're seeing here is probably some compaction. Uh, right here where the, where the planter gauge wheels run, and you can kind of see that the, the roots are kind of spread out. If you remember, those other roots were, were already starting to point down. So even though we've had all this rain, these roots have kind of stayed flat instead of going down to where they can catch moisture. So we would suspect that if it did turn off dry, that these would show um, water deficiency the earliest of the three, of the three treatments that we've, we've discussed so far. You know, got... One of the things that you might have noticed when we were standing in the field, and we apologize for that, we've had to move out of the wind. Uh, this one might have appeared a little more stunted than some of the others, and we would expect that. But uh, the reason, the probable reason that you're seeing that is that there's a little low spot out there and we did have water pond. So uh, some excessive water and uh, oxygen deprivation is, is contributing to this also. All right, so this is number four. Row cleaners were set too deep. So basically what we were doing, we were strip tilling while we were planting, uh, tilling up the, with the row cleaners too deep. And if you'll notice, these roots have stretched out uh, into the tilled area uh, because why? It's easier for them to grow right there. Uh, they've got less, they've got to put up less of a fight to get in and get their nutrients. So instead of growing down and getting all the nutrients when it, the plant becomes mature and have enough water and nutrients out of the roots, uh, you're growing out and also creating some sidewall compaction in there as well. This, this plant uh, exhibits, it's, it's the same uh, age and, and all, but I suspect that it may have, would have had opportunity to come up maybe a day earlier uh, for the simple reason. There wasn't a lot of, of um, trash on the field. So we wasn't doing, going through a, a lot of organic matter to get to the ground, but this would have had a little more heat and would have caused it to come up maybe a little bit quicker. Uh, it seems to be just a little, uh, maybe a little bigger but again, when we seen the picture of it out there in the field, you didn't see the area that was, that was as Jake called it, strip-tilled. 
uh, again, we've had so much water that, that uh, the trash and organic matter got swept back over the row. So it kind of covered itself up. But um, it, it, it is an issue, uh, especially if you do this on a, on a field with a slope. Richard, isn't that what you've seen? Absolutely, you'll see that. And as Greg alluded to, uh, that area that was tilled, or the, the row cleaners, and they do a little bit of tillage, uh, it does warm up quicker. Also, especially in heavy residue, the reason that we're running them uh, is to avoid uh, hair pinning uh, residue from the prior crop or from weeds into our uh, seed furrow and kicking our seed back out. Uh, but obviously, this one was just set too deep, and we trenched it. All right, folks, we're going to we're fixing to swap gears here just a little bit. The next four treatments we're gonna talk about is we went out here and we planted this when it was too wet. Now we actually had to come out and, and water the ground to make it too wet. I've got two treatments here that are no-till and then we actually come in here and disc and roll and plant it conventionally when it was too wet to see what it was. The treatment that we've got here, number five, is excessive closing wheel pressure when we planted no-till and it's too wet. And I'll let Jet, Jake explain what we're trying to see here. All right, so basically, if you look at this root structure, it's not as luscious as the other root structures we've come across in the no-till, uh, simply because we've pinched it, we've created some hard areas underneath here. Uh, Richard, you want to go? Well, one thing that I did observe on this is the, uh, the depth of the seed on, on this one's a little bit deeper. And also here, this is the one plot that probably showed what we were looking for. These uh, roots are running the seed furrow. They're not branching 360 degrees like everything else. So when we dug these, and I hope you can see that, this is, they were more like, like this it. right here following the furrow. Yeah, we did have one one, one plot that's, that's kind of giving us what we were looking for, and that's that sidewalk compaction of it being too wet. Even though we had the rain, and I alluded to that 10, 20% yield loss that, that's, that's hard to see visually, uh, this, this would start to do it because it's not allowing you, the roots to go out into the, uh, laterally to the, from the row to pick up the fertilizing moisture. That's basically going to run right down that right down that trench. We sealed the edges. Yes. And that's a, that's a problem that we talk about, a lot that can happen, but unless you go out and start digging and, and, and you see it, then it's, it's just not something you're going to see because this plant is essentially the same size as uh, of what we've been looking at that was optimal moisture. This is, uh, treatment is optimal closing wheel pressure. Everything was correct the way it was. It was just planted too wet. Again, you'll notice it compared to the one that the closing wheel pressure was too, too heavy on. This is a bigger, more robust plant. It looks like that out there in the field. But again, even though we had the pressure on the down pressure wheels correct, if you'll notice, and Jake's will sit here and show it and spin it around and, and all of that, this one really does show some sidewall compaction as the rows and and we dug this and this is the way it came out so we have no roots going out laterally through the seed furrow and so this is uh even though it's a bigger prettier plant it probably hasn't struggled as as much but um but if we get some dry conditions later on in the season this one is going to uh go down on us it's not going to perform this is treatment number seven excessive uh, closing wheel pressure. Now, again, these two treatments that we're going to talk about, we came out, we got the ground too wet, we actually come in, disc it, and rolled it, and then planted it. Um, a lot of us will go out, we'll get in a hurry, we're going to dry out some water holes, we're going to plant, uh, and that's what we're trying to show what we've got here. So this is disc roll, too wet, excessive closing wheel pressure. Again, we didn't see the sidewall compaction on this one nearly as much. I think there's a little bit, uh, but it just, it, um, it's just not as thrifty and as strong a looking plant. And uh, there could also be some issues 
underlying in the soil from hard pans from running the disc when it's too wet. Mm -hmm. But so, right now you've got roots penetrating down like we like to see in all of them uh, because we do have loose soil down to here. Right. So it's not a problem for them to go down in here. They may hit a, a traffic pan down here and cause a problem. But right now this just it was just a an issue where it was it was too wet um, with too much closing wheel pressure. Uh, again, conventional, too wet. This is optimal closing wheel pressure. Uh, again, uh, there was an inherent problem when we had this done. Uh, when the disc, it kind of bedded it up behind the disc and these two rows was over and actually stood in a little bit more water. Um, it's, uh, see again, the roots are, are coming out. They're nice, they're uniform, they're going out laterally and they're going down. Uh, but again, compared to some of the other plants that we have shown you here in the last few minutes, you can see these are just not as strong and thrifty a plant. So I'm down in the trench now, and, and we had this trench dug earlier this morning, hopefully to show you some of what is actually happening at the seed level. It's not going to be as, as good as we had hoped, but maybe you can get something out of this. This first one that we're looking at is our no-till optimal with the optimal closing wheel pressure. So, and you should always have your knife or some other tool with you. So you can look here and you can see what our roots have done on these two rows. Uh, they're spreading out, they're coming on down. Uh, everything is pretty much like we would like to see. So we'll move on to, uh, again, optimal conditions, but with excessive closing wheel pressure. All right, so what I've tried to, to show you here is that uh, you can see where the roots are and they're coming on down again, uh, like what we would like to see. We've got roots out over here, so they are spreading out. Uh, we expected to see uh, a little more compaction here where those closing wheels were pressing down onto that seed furrow. It's not really showing up in either row here. So we do have some roots. You can see where I've covered the plant up here. So the roots are doing okay. We're just not seeing exactly what we thought we would see. So we move over into, again, uh, no-till optimal conditions, but with too much down pressure. And you can see where my roots are right here. We're up here on top of the ground. We really did not get a whole lot of roots going down. We definitely have some, but not what, uh, what we want to see. We want to see those roots going through the profile, and we're not getting it. We ran our row cleaners too deep uh, here, so we actually trenched this out. So you can see, it, it's a little hard to see, but we, we are trenched down just a little bit. And again, you see where my roots are. Uh, they're spreading, but they're spreading on top of the ground. Again, same plot. My roots are right here near the surface. Okay, moving into this set of plots, this is where uh, this was watered to get it too wet for us. This is no-tilled. Uh, too wet with excessive closing wheel pressure. We do have our roots coming on down here. They're not spreading out. Well, there we go. So they are spreading a little bit. Uh, maybe better than what I would have expected to see here. But this is that pressure on the back end, and it's, it's closing that, uh, and it's forcing. Uh, we showed uh, a plant, I think, that uh, showed where it's following the furrow a little bit. This one's not doing it uh, quite as badly as, as the example plant we had, but we still did see it further over into the plot. Again, we're too wet here, but this is optimal closing wheel pressure, and you see where my roots are. They're coming on down here. We're, oh, I don't know, 10, maybe 11 inches uh, below the soil level here. Uh, same thing here, maybe not quite so deep, but they're coming on down, just what we want to see. Now we're moving over into the disc and rolled. Again, this was way too wet. If it's too wet to disc, it's too wet to no-till. 
We've got roots coming down uh, every bit as far as what we saw in the last plot. So uh, we did not expect to see this. We expected a little more compaction uh, where these roots would have maybe uh, hit the hard pan and spread out. But uh, both rows, it's got good, good root development, just what we want. But again, we were not looking to see this. Again, conventional tillage, disc and rolled uh, with optimal closing wheel pressure. We're maybe eight inches deep on our roots, so we did not get down, we didn't get the penetration uh, that we did with the excessive closing wheel pressure. It's not one of those things, I really know uh, what to tell you why it happened. This is one of those goof plots that it just didn't goof up uh, quite like we were looking for. Cover crops are beneficial uh, if you can make them work for you. Uh, the NRCS here in West Tennessee is pushing a five-way to seven-way blend. Uh, so therefore, I've had to figure out ways to come about life with the cover crops. So the cover crops, what we're basically doing, we're taking those cover crops after we harvest beans, cotton, corn, we're coming in, we're either flying it on right before harvest or we're drilling it and spreading it right after harvest, uh, trying to get them to come up. So they're gonna grow all winter long. And so we're looking at uh, legumes, we're looking at grasses. Uh, we've got everything under the sun in these cover crop fields. Uh, you'll walk out, uh, there's greens out there, turnip greens. So it's everything, it's, it's a glorified food plot is what I, what I really think. Uh, the deer love it, the turkeys love it. Uh, but also our ground, our soils love it because what we're doing is we're keeping our microorganisms in the soils active all winter long and they're actively moving and they've got live plant material to help them move through. Uh, so they're helping break down. Uh, what we do is we come in, I recommend four, three to four weeks prior to planting uh, if you're going cotton and corn. Uh, just so you can get some good seed to soil contact. If you're trying to plant green into it, I recommend taking your old uh, hooded sprayer out of the bushes, uh, rigging you up some drop nozzles in between the hoods, and you spray an eight inch band where you can RTK run your tractors on those bands. That way you wanna do it at least four weeks out in advance. That way you've got uh, a dead strip in that cover crop and you've got the rest of it green and so what we'll do we'll come in we'll plant on those dead strips uh, we get very good seed to soil contact if you're not killing your crop, cover crop out early enough you're not going to get good seed to soil contact and you're going to have a very spotty skippy stand you're going to get frustrated with it it's going to aggravate you all year uh, some of the other issues that we run into uh, we got lots of rain this year. And so if you're gonna kill your cover crop out four weeks in advance before planting, you don't have any control of knowing exactly when that rain's gonna come. So you've got dead plant material on top of the ground and it rains, what's it gonna do? It's gonna hold moisture and prevent you from planting as soon as you want to. So therefore, that's why a lot of people are going to the planting green. That way they can keep they can keep the soil active and if it rains, those green plants can actually help dry out the soil a little bit faster and even though you've got those dead bands, it'll still pull the moisture out. Uh, the other issue that we've got to talk about, if you've got green cover crop you're planting into, you've also got what we call a green bridge. So we've got insects in those cover crops that are feeding on it. Three corner alfalfa hoppers are one. You're going to have a lot of debris what other insect loves hiding in debris? Slugs. Uh, we've come across a lot of slug issues too. Uh, so you've got to think about maybe when you go out and kill that cover crop, maybe you need to put a pesticide in with it to keep those three corner alfalfa hoppers from transferring over and uh, destroying your crop before you realize what's actually going on. Uh, it does help raise your organic matter. For some of these farmers around West Tennessee, they don't have big massive fields where they can put center pivots or irrigation on. So they're trying to figure out, all right, how can I hold more water 
that Mother Nature's given me for the growth of my plants. So they're planting these cover crops, uh, trying to raise the organic matter in their soils to hold a little bit more water for when it is time, when Mother Nature cuts off the irrigation and we need some water for our plants. So just be prepared if you're not in cover crops, if you don't know a lot about it, uh, I wouldn't advise jumping out and doing all your acres in it. I would try a few hundred acres at first, figure out what works for you, what works best on your operation, and run from there. We'd like to encourage you now that you've watched uh, No-Till Basics to try some of our other tours, such as no-till soybean production, no-till cotton production, weed control, many other uh, programs that will go a little bit more in-depth than what we were able to. And if you want to find out some of our data uh, from variety trials that we've got going on here at the University of Tennessee and UT Extension, uh, go visit utcrops.com and you can find all the data you want. And we would like to, again, thank you for watching this presentation. Uh, we apologize if we put you, put you to sleep. We've done this for 40 years in the field, every 20 minutes on the hottest day in July. And for the, what did we say a while ago? 80, 88 years. 88 years of experience between the three of us. This is our first time on video. Um, so thank you for putting up with us. Have a good evening.